Thank you very, very much. I'm delighted to be with you. And I want to especially thank Dr. Meg Bakewell and Dr. Matt Kaplan for inviting me and for making this session possible. Um, as Meg pointed out, our aim here today is for, and I've got, an, got it outlined here on this slide, for, um, for you to understand something about how it is that transparently designed assignments do offer equitable learning opportunities for all college students to succeed, and then to consider applications of that in your own context. The tasks that we'll pursue today or the way we'll go about this is, first of all, I'll provide a review of our research findings as Meg pointed out, and then um, we'll work in small groups and then in pairs to apply that research to your own assignments and our criteria for success are these you'll leave with some understanding of the research and some strategies for applying that transparent framework to your own teaching um, and if you stay for the second part where we work on drafts of assignments then you'll actually walk out of here with a draft of a transparently designed assignment that you could begin to use today or tomorrow or next term uh, in your own courses now, this Transparency in Learning and Teaching project has caught on in a pop popular way, I think, for three main reasons. First, this is about a small teaching intervention that has a large impact on student success. Second, that impact is statistically significant for all students to a small degree, and it is more beneficial for underserved students. So it becomes almost a social justice method of teaching. Uh, and third, this is something that faculty can implement right now to complement other kinds of student success initiatives that tend to be more top-down administrative types of efforts, things like um, curricular redesign or gen ed program redesign, uh, intrusive advising policies or scholarship funds. This complements those kinds of efforts by uh, allowing faculty to contribute in a day-to-day -day way to student success at the classroom level. Um, the data that you're going to look at today comes largely from a study that we did with the Association of American Colleges and Universities that was funded by TG Philanthropy. And I want to credit my co-investigators here, Tia Brown McNair and Ashley Finley. Uh, and I'll highlight here the list of schools who participated in that initial study. Um, those schools are interesting because they are all minority serving institutions, but they're different types of minority serving institutions. And we chose this group of schools because they are broadly representative of different sorts of schools around the country, not just in terms of the type of minority serving school that they are, but also in terms of their size, which ranges from very small to very large. Uh, in terms of their geographic location, they're very dispersed around the country. Uh, and also in terms of the type of school, two-year college, four-year college research universities, because we wanted to have a mix where our findings would feel relevant to faculty from any type of institution around the country. And the results of that study, the, the, the re research results that I'll review are published in this peer review um, spring 2016 issue, which is cited on the flip side of the top page on your handout. Uh, and that issue of the journal, it's completely devoted to this project. It also contains a chapter by the faculty at each school talking about the difference that it made for them in their classrooms and in their context with their own students at those different institutions. Um, our, the research team behind the scenes that did a lot of the statistical analysis that you'll be seeing today is here and I want to just uh, credit them for their hard work. Uh, so this project that we undertook with the AACNU uh, was one in which we took this on because we were particularly concerned about the context in higher education where more students than ever before have access to college, whether it's community college, four-year college, university. More diverse students than ever before are making it into higher ed uh, institutions, but once they're there, they don't experience anything like an equitable educational experience. For example, we know from um, federal uh, government data about higher education that 
underrepresented students, first generation students, low income students, um, those students are about half as likely to complete college in four years as their white and Asian peers. And that is particularly devastating when you realize that that right there is the new incoming majority population of college students in this country, underrepresented in terms of their ethnicities, first generation of their families to go to college or low income Pell eligible students. Uh, we also know that now a gatekeeper mentality is really unsustainable for that population, that, that new majority population of students. The gatekeeper mentality to it would sound something like this. Um, and I'll, my own field is art history, so uh, a gatekeeper approach to that might sound like, it's my job to teach you art history, but it's not my job to teach you how to learn art history. And if you can't figure out that part on your own, then I should weed you up so you don't continue in this field. That's a kind of gatekeeper mentality that does not work any longer for the new incoming majority population of college students in this country. And further, that is a kind of mentality that is unproductive for research achievements. We know from researchers like Malcolm Gladwell, for example, that it's the outlier thinkers from across disciplines or the differently prepared thinkers who tend to be the ones who will break through research research problems. Uh, and a gatekeeper mentality would conversely produce all the same type of thinker who think like the people who have the research problems. Um, another reason for this equity crisis in higher education is that high achievement in high schools can often frustrate college students' success, largely because we know that even the best prepared high school students are, are prepared at a novice level for any specific discipline. But in college, students are expected to begin thinking at a more expert level inside of those disciplines. And because of the ways that novices and experts approach disciplines differently, um, the well-prepared novice often is frustrated in college success because they're not yet equipped to think like an expert inside a discipline. For example, let's take my field of art history. Um, if I'm asking for new incoming university students to write a research paper where they're using a Renaissance painting or sculpture from the 15th century as evidence to support their idea, how would a novice to art history know how to do that if they'd never seen an example of what that looks like in practice? Or similarly, how would a student use a chemical reaction as evidence of their thesis or their um, hypothesis if they didn't know what that looked like in practice. Yeah. Um, so see, there's, these are some of the reasons we think for that equity crisis in higher education. And it was the effort of our project with the AACMU to take that on and to see if we could combine some practices in teaching that had promise for especially helping underserved students have equitable opportunities to succeed in college. And so we combined together inside of this transparent framework kind of two components. One was in general transparency about teaching methods and the other was to ground the work in a kind of problem-centered way. And I'll just, as you know, I'll quickly review that problem-centered approach means that we're engaging students in real world scenarios and problems that they might face to just ground the theoretical work from a discipline in a classroom into a real world application. And then transparency is this practice that focuses not just on the what or the content of a course, but it explicitly calls attention to how students are learning that content and why we are manipulating their learning experiences in particular ways. Uh, and so when we combine those two, the results that we, uh, the way that we did it was we asked for teachers to use that transparent framework of purpose, task, and criteria that we began our session with today, we asked them to use that to tweak or revise two take-home assignments in the course of an entire term with students. And the faculty that were involved in this study, there were about 35 of them, and we had about five faculty in a team at each of these seven schools. And the number of students we worked with overall was about 1,800. And you can see how the demographics break down for, those, for that group of students in our study. So we asked the teachers just to tweak two assignments, to use transparency as a framework two times in the term on take-home assignments. And the reason we asked them for, to, to try it just twice 
is we honestly wanted to see how little could you change and still have a significant impact on student success or on benefits for students learning. Uh, now here again, I want to just show you the exact framework that we provided for the teachers in our study. And you have a copy of this on, I believe, page six of your handout. Um, and we'll look through that handout in more detail later. It's a kind of encyclopedic reference tool for you. Um, but most of what I say is summarized in this handout, uh, including the research results that you're about to see. They're summarized on around page 10 of the handout. Um, and so this was the framework that we provided for the teachers. And we didn't require them to use this in any rigid, measurable way so that they would all be doing it in exactly the same way, because we knew that was unreasonable. So we said, in your own way, consistent with your own teaching style and your own relationship with the students in the classroom, um, at your own discretion, please use this framework to frame a conversation with students about those two assignments before the students start doing the work. And we asked the teachers to, to communicate with the students about three main things, the purpose, the task, and the criteria of those two assignments before students started working on them. Now the purpose, we pointed out to these faculty, um, has two parts. First, what skills would the student practice from doing this assignment? What would they practice while they're doing the assignment? What important disciplinary skills or other skills, critical thinking skills, are they actually engaging and practicing? And then second, what knowledge, what discipline specific knowledge would the students gain from doing this particular assignment? And where we embedded that problem centered piece was right here. How do those skills and that specific knowledge have any long term relevance for the students lives beyond the context of this single assignment, maybe even beyond college learning outcomes. What was the real long-term relevance for students? That's where we embedded the problem center piece. And then the second thing we asked teachers and students to talk about ahead of time before students did the, the assignment was the task. Just simply what should the students do and how should they do it? What steps to follow? What steps to avoid? And this aimed to help students spend the bulk of their time producing the highest quality work possible. Third, and finally, we asked teachers and students to think together about the criteria for success before the students started working. And for most of the teachers in, that, in our study, that involved both a checklist or sometimes a rubric, uh, but some identification of criteria for success for. And then also, we asked teachers to provide annotated examples of past student assignments so that students would get a look at what does it look like to fulfill these criteria in practice in this discipline that is unfamiliar to me or in this particular context in this discipline that I'm here to learn about. Um, how many of you, just show of hands, actually would have a whole trove of past student work where you have written permission from the students to begin sharing it with future students? All right, I think I see one hand waving, and that turned out to be the case with the teachers in our study, too. Not many of them had past examples that they could share. So what we did to compensate for our lack of preparatory planning in this area turned out to be a better solution than the annotated examples would have been, because we sent those teachers out to find real-world examples of work in their disciplines. So for example, a journalism course um, took a paragraph out of a newspaper article in the community. Um, an engineering course, took a photograph of a bridge construction project and brought that into the class. Um, in other uh, disciplines, you might take a paragraph out of a journal article. Um, but these examples the teachers brought into the class and then they had the students look at those real world examples and apply the teacher's checklist of criteria for success to those real world examples. And that stimulated a kind of talk, a kind of discussion that helps students see what does it look like when these criteria are happening in practice? And what does it look like when they're met to the fullest degree? And what does it look like when the criteria are met to an adequate degree, but not perfectly? Right? So this was all we, we asked teachers to do at the beginning of our study. And the experience that they had of drafting an assignment is exactly the experience that you will have in our second hour together today. Um, so I want to show you what happened after we asked the teachers to do this. 
we ended up noticing that students' learning was boosted in three significant ways. Um, first of all, students' academic competence increased for those students who got this more transparent treatment. Their sense of belonging in college increased. And third, they became more metacognitively, consciously aware that they were building up skills that are the skills that employers on national surveys say they care the most about. Um, and these findings were, were really important for us because those first two in particular, the academic confidence and the sense of belonging, those are success predictors for college students. According to researchers who are cited on the flip side of the top page of your handout, people like uh, the Walton and Cohn 2011 Science Magazine article or the Hausman and Ye work, um, those folks have already connected higher confidence and sense of belonging with increased persistence in college and higher grades. And so we thought we might see in the short term um, higher grades or better student success and maybe in the long term we might even see better retention rates for students from year to year um, in our study. And so I want to show you what this looks like in a graph Form. You've got a copy of this around page 10 of your handout. Um, how many education researchers do we actually have in the audience here? Just give me a wave. Okay, so I see one hand in the back. There may be one off on the edge. Um, so what I want to call attention to, for, to, to in this chart um, is the effect size values that are listed down the center of the chart just to, the, just to your left of the bars and that's the ES equals values. And in education research, as some of you will know, we're looking for a kind of cutoff point, an effect size or a magnitude of difference, a magnitude of effect around 0.25 or larger to be considered publishable and significant. And then an effect size of around 0.5 would be considered a medium magnitude of effect, and around 0.8 would be considered very large, a very big difference, a very big magnitude of effect. And so for all students across all disciplines in our study, so all demographics of students in every subject area uh, in these courses in our study, we noticed an effect size or a magnitude of effect that was between small and medium in size for all of the students in the study. Um, in terms of the, their awareness of the employer valued skills, their academic competence and their sense of belonging. And then we taught we should look at students in both groups at the beginning of term just to be sure that there were no big differences between those two groups, that none of those students who got the treatment were already more likely to succeed than any of the other students who didn't get the treatment. And what we noticed was no statistically significant differences between those two groups according to their competence and their awareness of their skills at the beginning of the term or their confidence levels in particular skill areas. There was no significant difference at the beginning of term. And then at the end of term, again, when we look at the underserved students, we saw a much larger difference, a, a much bigger magnitude of effect. And so here I show you the slide for first generation college students. Um, and you can see that the effect size values here are in the medium to large range right, for the employer valued skills and the sense of confidence and the sense of belonging. And we had similar results for um, different types of underserved students, for multiracial students, for low income students, etc. And then remember I mentioned that we thought we might find an, an impact on retention rates for students from year to year. So in that first original AACNU study, we did not have the foresight to get permission to gather students' ID numbers so that we could track their retention. So we did a parallel study for a large group of UNLV students to look at the impact of re on retention for this transparent treatment. And the reason that University of Nevada Las Vegas students are a good choice, that's my institution, is that we have, according to US News and World Report, the most diverse undergraduate student body of any uh, university in the nation. So the majority of all of our student body, not just the incoming students, but all of our students, the majority of them fall into this underserved category. 
And so what we noticed um, and in terms of the impact on retention rate you see here, uh, for first time, full time, first year students, the average retention rate in the 2015 fall coming back the 2016 fall, our average retention rate that year was 77.1%, as you see. Uh, and then for the 871 students in our test group who got that more transparent treatment, that retention rate went up to close to 86%, which is a significant difference there and an encouraging one. And then when we looked at how that breaks down across the demographic groups, we noticed a similar pattern in this study to what we saw in the AACMU study funded by TG Philanthropy. In this UNLV study, we noticed that for the more underserved students, the benefits were larger. And you can see how that breaks down according to retention rates across the demographic groups here. The underrepresented ethnicity is the first generation students and the low income students. Um, so what we think we're seeing here is a kind of pattern um, where, and I, and I should say that um, if you were to remove from the red bars, those students who were in the more transparent courses, because these are sort of the large averages, if you were to remove from them, you might see larger differences even between these groups. But what we think we're seeing overall is a kind of pattern similar to what we saw in the AACNU study, where this kind of transparent instruction is significantly helpful for all students to a small degree, and especially helpful to the underserved students to a larger degree so that it's a kind of social justice way of leveling the playing field of opportunity for all students. Um, and when we looked at particular skill sets in the UNLV group, we also saw that according to particular kinds of learning outcomes, like for example here, how much did this course help you in collaborating effectively with others to build up that skill set, we noticed really large magnitude of effect here in the differences between the group that got the treatment and those who didn't. Um, you can see here, in, that was the STEM group, and this is the humanities group. Um, and we noticed similar differences across like writing skills as a skill set, for example, also. Um, so I want to just remind you that what this looks like, this very simple framework of purpose task criteria, which you will discover in our second hour together, is a little harder than it might look um, at first blush in terms of how you implement it but it's a relatively simple way of discussing academic work with students. And this is all we gave to our teachers, um, and we asked them to use this at their own discretion in their own way. So now I wanna just pause to see what comments or questions there are about that research review portion before we go on to look at examples of what does transparent design look like in practice. Um, so Meg, if anyone's muted out there, you might want to unmute here to see if there are questions. Yes. Potomac got us unmuted. So uh, the microphone is up here. It picks up pretty well most of the room if you project just a little bit. So the last bar charts that you show from your own data, you went up data. Um, how did you determine <laughs> courses that fit the more transparent uh, definition because ah, your that is a great question. Um, so in order to determine what was more transparent or less transparent, um, there are nine questions for students on the Tilt Higher Ed survey. And those surveys are free for anyone to use if you want to get your own students views, you could get similar charts to what you've seen. But these are nine questions that triangulate around the concepts of purpose, you see those three questions at the top of the slide are about purpose, and then the middle set is about task, and the third set is about criteria. And the students chose to answer all of these nine questions on a Likert scale that went from never, sometimes, often, always. And then we meaned together those responses in order to get a transparency score for each course. And then there was a cutoff point between the more and the less that fell sometime in somewhere in between the sometimes and the often. And um, with each new group that we study, we find where is the sort of natural cutoff that will give us a group that's roughly, you know, half on one end and half on the other, somewhere in between the sometimes and often values. And then how often, I mean, there are what? Three, four questions that everybody, faculty at Michigan, have to ask, and then there's 
literally what hundreds of optional choices and I'm seeing these numbers are 36 through 44 so um, given that you did this kind of after the fact of the initial study how frequent did you have find instructors that use these particular items oh so these questions actually were part of the original study we used a survey that has 44 or maybe now 46 questions on it that all of the faculty invited their students to complete at the end of the term. Usually it goes out, um, if you sign up to run this with your own students, you would um, ask your students, probably during the last week of classes, the last week that classes meet, they would fill out this survey. It's all, as you see, kind of questions about their learning experiences um, and about their confidence level and about their sense of belonging. Um, it's, it's mostly about their learning experiences. Um, and the students fill out those survey questions in the last week of term, and then um, we use that data to produce all of the kinds of charts and graphs that you've seen about levels of confidence and belonging and the uh, amount of transparency in the course, um, and um, yeah, all of those measures that appeared in the chart. So this, all of these questions were indeed part of the original study. Thank you. Sure. What other questions or concerns do you have about any of what we've heard so far? I'm curious about the um, African American student data that you showed. Yes, let's go back to that. Oh, let me show you one more thing though. So this is an example of some of like, here are the questions that have to do with the employer value skills. Right, how much has this course helped you in? And then we list a whole bunch of different employer value skills that come off of um, national surveys of employers about what they're looking for. Just to give you a sense of what are the questions that are on that survey. You can also look um, at the survey questions yourself and download them if you want to see them. Um, the website where you can do that is listed at the bottom in the footer of every page of the handout. Um, then let's go back and look at that demographic question. So is this the slide you were talking about when you had the question about the African American students? So I saw um, a pretty big difference on this slide, but then on another slide that was like a rotated column. Bar so chart. on one of the particular skill sets, it was. Yeah, there just seems to be a really, a really big difference between African American students and everybody else. There are still gains, but they're just not nearly as large as the other groups. Yeah, and so this is part of. Um, this is a, a very helpful question because what I, I want to point out here is that if you look at the end, the sample sizes for the students who are in the study, we have, like if you look at the non-white students, that's a group of 789 students out of our 871, right? And that's because UNLV has this very, very diverse undergraduate student population. Um, but then when you look at the, and the sample sizes for most of these groups are well above the 250 student threshold or the, the sample size of 250, which is the threshold for the federal government's what works clearinghouse for research, for fundable research. But when you look at the number of African American students who were in the courses at UNLV who got the more transparent treatment, there were only 86 of them. So that is not a really large enough sample size to be considered as reliable as the other measures where those groups are all over that threshold number of 250. So what we need is to do more demographic analysis to get more African American students into our mix from all kinds of schools in order to know that that particular difference is reliable. But in this case, that wouldn't be considered a large enough sample size to be nearly as reliable as the other comparisons that we're showing. And yeah. so um, what you might be seeing then when we look at the specific questions on the survey is the result of that. And so, you know, in this case, we only have 28 students in this bar here on the collaboration skills, and we only have 31 students in the blue bar. So those numbers are so tiny. Um, that, and that's what happens when you begin to aggregate on particular skill sets, right? So all of these numbers actually are in the, you know, 
here's a group of 200 and a group of almost 200, but for the African American students, our numbers are always going to be smaller as we continue to disaggregate because the initial group was too small. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay, John? Do you have a sense of um, what percentage of your survey respondents um, intentionally implemented sort of transparent methodologies and uh, which portion just had uh, qualities of of transparent teaching inherent in the way that they normally do business? Um, so in our original AACNU study, those 35 faculty were all teaching um, two sections of the same course. And we said in one section, teach all the assignments the same way you ever did. And in the other section, revise those two, assi two assignments to make them more transparent. And so that was the way we were able to be comparing almost apples to apples. These were students in the same semester, in the same course, in the same cohort group. Um, and so the teachers intentionally did and didn't use this method. So that the teachers also, it's an apples to apples kind of comparison. Is that what you were asking though? I'm not sure I really answered what you were asking. That's close, I mean, based on the, the survey, results that we were looking at. I was trying to get a sense of what percentage of the end intentionally implemented this methodology. Of, so with the 35 faculty, we had them all implement it in one section and not implement it in the other section. But because human subjects are not perfectly clean like in a Petri dish, some of our faculty told us into the study that they were noticing benefits for students and they felt guilty about not, they really had this sort of moral dilemma because they felt guilty about not giving the students in the control group that benefit. So some of them admitted to us later that they had kind of snuck in a little bit of transparency into the control group, but not a whole lot. And so that was why we ended up not listening so much to what the faculty said about this was my control and this was my intervention, but instead we went to those nine survey questions that were designed to get at the amount of transparency students actually received. And that's why we divided into more transparent and less transparent as opposed to completely transparent and completely not. Just so one sort of follow-up question. Those that um, intentionally implemented uh, this methodology, do you get a sense of whether there was a change in the mix between uh, this more sort of formative assignment versus the use of a summative assessment for their final grade? Um, that is an interesting question, and I think that you will see some of what the difference looks like when we look at some of the assignments from the actual original study. You'll be able to see sort of how did these assignments differ before and after, um, what it took for teachers to transform those assignments, and then you can decide um, how transparent you think they really are. Um, even if the students in our study defined them as more, I bet you might be able to actually find ways to make them even more transparent. Did you hand up? I did, which follows very well on what you just said. So the definition that you're using or the descriptive of transparent has three elements, the purpose, the task, the criteria. And I've often um, heard or considered a fourth, which is the prerequisites, what, what, the, what our students expect to come in with. And so my question for you is uh, whether you considered other uh, dy uh, dynamics of, of transparency and uh, whether you consider that, that prerequisite. Thank you so much for that question because that gets us exactly to what I wanted us to look at next, which is reviewing other transparent principles in other people's research. Um, and if uh, if there, why don't we move on to that at this point? Um, and then I'll also take questions at the very end again if there are further ones. Or by email, you can find my email on every page of the handout as well. Um, so I want us to take a look at this idea of transparency because what we've offered is a kind of framework, a simple framework, as you say, of purpose, task, and criteria. But embedded in that um, is a lot of ideas from past research about how we design assignments. 
Um, and I want to review that really quickly with you right now um, to sh just show you what do some of these look like in practice. Because I'm saying that students need to see what things look like in practice, so I want to follow and model that message as well. Um, so on the top page of your handout, you see a chart that looks like this. And your chart has a third column on the right that gives you a space to jot anything down that might be useful to you if you want to use one of these strategies. What you see in the left-hand column is the last names of authors whose research tells us something about how we should design assignments transparently. And so the full citations to those authors' work um, is on the flip side of that top page of the handout. So the first takeaway idea about transparent design from other people's research is this, and uh, is that varied and flexible formats will appeal equitably to students' strengths. Varied and flexible formats for assignments. And if you turn to page one, heading one on your handout, which looks like this, I'll show you three examples of what that might look like in practice. So it's not, it's not the first page, it's the next page, and it's got a heading one over it that has this first principle from other people's research. Um, and so here what I'm showing you, um, you've got three boxes on this page. I'm just showing you the top half of the page so you'll recognize it. This is an assignment where a teacher said, give me an outline so I can suggest to you some help so that you can then write your full paper. And you see that this was a paper in a, it was an introduction to music course. It was actually a sort of cross-disciplinary gen ed core course um, at Harvard University. And what the teacher expected to see from students was an ABC123 outline like on the left. What Miley Nakamura, a Japanese American student whose permission we have to publish this example, and we have, what Miley turned in for her outline was this box diagram over on the top right. Now, how many of you look at that box diagram and you think, yeah, that's how I sketch out my ideas when I'm outlining things? Meg, are their hands raised? <laughs> okay, and that is often the case. This, this box diagram method of outlining ideas um, Often the people who resonate with that are either in theater as a, as a discipline, or sometimes an engineer will look at this and, and intuitively get what this student meant, or students who went to elementary school in Japan who were trained to diagram ideas this way also kind of intuitively get this when they see it. But for this student, if the assignment had been, I want an ABC123 outline, if it had been a not very flexible assignment, in that way. This student would have had to diagram her ideas as you see, write the complete paper, and from the complete paper deduce the outline ABC123 that the teacher wanted to see. And this diagram that you see on the left is what the teacher drew up after talking with Miley about her box diagram. It was like the teacher's vision of what that box diagram meant for Miley. But the process for Miley would have been entirely broken. She would have had to write the paper and deduce from it the outline so that the teacher could then give her helpful suggestions about how to write the paper that she had just written. So for this student, this particular kind of assignment would not have been helpful. It would have been a kind of broken exercise for her. Um, and then on the bottom half of the page, you see a third way that the same assignment might be given. Um, just basic ideas about you know, what are the big sources you're using, primary and secondary? What counter arguments are you worried about? And what questions do you have? The kind of how can I actually help you question. So this is an example that shows you more flexible formats for giving that kind of an assignment. And for the teachers in our study, when they saw this, they got very nervous and they said, we cannot possibly give every assignment three ways. And we said, that's fine. That's not what we're asking you to do. We're just saying, over the course of an entire term with students, try to vary the types of assignments enough so that at any moment in the course, each student will at one moment feel like they're working inside of their comfort zone for their particular approach or learning style. Then the second big idea from other people's research 
um, is this. We want to build up students' critical thinking skills in an intentional sequence. You see two examples of this on page two, heading two on your handout. Now, we, we obviously know that we're trying to build up students' critical thinking skills in a sequence, but the students don't necessarily know what that sequence looks like from our heads. So here's an example from a team taught business course at the top of your page at the University of Illinois, where they went and found the skill sets that their accrediting body defines for business schools. And they listed those skill sets across the top of the chart from left to right. And then down the left hand side of the chart vertically, they listed the dates, the due dates for the homework assignments. And then they put an X in each box where the homework assignment was helping students to build up that particular skill set. So in one diagram here, students could get a view of how they're building up all the skills in a course over time. And often when people sketch out a chart like this, you will see a progression from simplest skill at a top left to more complicated compound skills down at the lower right. Um, another example I put in here is your classic plumes taxonomy, which many of you already have. But I give you this version of it because I like the assignment cues over on the right hand column. If you use these vocabulary words, these will help you to cause students to do the kind of thinking that are uh, on the left hand columns of the chart corresponding there. Takeaway idea number three from other people's research, and we only have six of them, so we're halfway through. Takeaway idea number three is we want to specify the criteria up front and encourage students to self-monitor their work while they're doing that work. Um, and here's an example because I'm mixing this up across the disciplines. Here's an example from an essay writing context and another from a chemistry lab context. Takeaway idea number four is we want to provide those annotated examples of work before students start working. And because our teachers in our study didn't have them, they went out and found real world examples that they could talk with their students about. Uh, and that turned out to be better. But here's an example of a biology paper where the professor, Carol Augsburger from the University of Illinois, has actually given students annotations on the left hand column of, you know, here's the importance of this study. Here's what prior research says. And then here's my own example um, when I wanted students in an architectural history course, each one to write a glossary entry that would become part of the glossary for the catalog that the course was building together. And my goal was not for students to explore different methods of writing an entry and to figure that out. My goal was instead for them to produce a high quality entry on their first try so that those entries could be used by the whole class later. So I just spelled out for them the three steps that were involved. Takeaway idea number five from other research is that we want to structure peer feedback opportunities for students. Here's an example from a physics course by Eric Mazur at Harvard where he will teach a concept and then give students a question to discuss together in real time in the class. And then when he judges from the way the students answer this multiple choice question, he knows if they got the concept or if he needs to reteach it. And he knows that in real time. And what he discovers is that students' understanding increases dramatically after he gives them two minutes to talk it over with each other. Here's an example from uh, an essay writing context that could be adjusted across disciplines. Just another way to structure an opportunity for students to give fee peer feedback to one another. And then finally, takeaway idea number six, we've compiled into this purpose task criteria transparent assignment template for you on page six, where you see the teacher's version of that template. Uh, and then on, I think, the final page of your handout, you also see the student's version of the handout that subsequently we have started distributing to all incoming first year students at UNLV. Because no matter how well you design your assignment, students will know better about how to tell you to make it more transparent to them in particular. And so many times teachers walk into the class with an assignment and this handout that you can copy because we put it there to be copied. And you can copy it from the electronic version of the handout that um, Dr. Bakewell will share with you as well after this session. Uh, but this is a way that you could frame the conversation with students about an assignment before they start doing it. So now I wanted to show you some of the sample assignments from our actual study so that you can get an even more concrete idea of how this looks in practice. 
And I'm going to ask you to read sample A, which is appearing on page seven of your handout. And there's a blue arrow next to it that says sample A on page seven. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to read that through. You'll notice that page seven is labeled less transparent. So this was one of the less transparent assignments from our UNLV study. Um, and I want you to read this through looking for just one thing, which is on the top of the slide you see right now. That one thing is the purpose. Remember the purpose has two parts, the skills the student will practice and the knowledge the student will gain from doing this assignment. And when you see where the skills and knowledge are defined in this assignment, I want you to give me a wave. And Meg, you can tell me when we have some waves out there and when we're ready to start talking about sample A. But right now, read it through and just find where is the purpose? Where's the skills and the knowledge? couple of more waves. Okay, so where in sample A do you see either the knowledge or the skills? What part of the assignment do you find it? September 6th. I did not hear that. Part four. Part six. Part, so I'm hearing part four and part six. So where in part six? Part six. Part three, okay, so part six, subsection three, and part four is where you see what? The, is that the knowledge? Yeah. And what is that knowledge? <coughs> what knowledge will students gain? For your specific? Yeah, they'll find out something about their career. Now that's actually a pretty motivating purpose, to learn something about a possible career for you. But it was kind of hard to find it. That knowledge gain that is offered to the student by this assignment, that knowledge gain is really hard to find. And if you wanted to make this, trans this assignment more transparent, more relevant, more accessible to students, you might want to headline that earlier than part four and part six, subsection three. Right? That would be one way to make this more transparent. Now look at the skills. What skills would the student need practice in order to complete this assignment? Let's just name them out, call them out, and we'll start listing them. Interview skills. Yeah, let's break that down a little. That's a compound skill. Yeah. So write in the questions in advance. Yes. Knowing which questions to ask. Uh -huh. I pick a few that are really relevant or the things that you really want to know. That's challenging. Good. What other skills? Confidence to talk to a professional. I think that would be intimidating. Absolutely. Other skills? Knowing where to find people who might want to. Good. So that's a kind of research. Yeah. What other skills are in there that you see? What skills students need to do this assignment? Uh, tech skills uh, to, to, to record the, the interview. Yeah, recording and transcribing. There are some real technology-based skills here. What else? They need to be outgoing and to actually contact. Yeah, sort of interpersonal skills. Good. They have to write the paper. Yeah, writing. So they have to write the letter to um, outreach to the um, Professional that right, so there's a couple kinds of writing, professional writing and, and academic, more academic paper writing. So we're already up to 10 skills, and we could keep listing if we were to break down those skills. Like if you took research skills and broke it down, you'd come up with evaluation and synthesizing. So but we would go way beyond our 10 initial skills that we see. So let's assume that because this is an intro level course for first year students, the teacher didn't really expect for the students to simultaneously focus in a metacognitive way on how they are developing 10 plus skills simultaneously. So can you tell 
from the way this assignment is written, what might be the top one or two skills that the teacher wanted the students to focus on the most? Can you tell from how it's written? Taking heads. Yeah, you, you really can't because this is an example of a not transparent assignment. This assignment is not transparent, it is not equitable, it is not fair to the new incoming majority student in higher ed. This, this assignment privileges those students who know something about how to parse a college assignment and what college papers tend to look like, or it privileges those students who have someone in their family they can ask about that, and it privileges those students who know where to go to get this kind of help in order to parse an assignment that is not clear. It privileges those students who are able to identify that there's something wrong with this assignment. Right? This is not transparent. Now I want you to look at sample C, and I'll tell you up front that is the revised version of sample A. This is what happened after the teachers got papers they did not think were very successful, and they went back and used the transparent framework to revise the assignment. And I want you to look at what that took. How is it different from sample A, and how is it pretty much the same? Because here's where you get a sense of how much of a not really a very heavy lift it was to convert this from less transparent to more transparent. So what do you see about differences? What's different and what's the same? The task is the same, is that what I heard? Yeah, and if you look around at assignments now, you will see that assignments, like most assignments are all about the task. They're 100% task. And so for this one, part of what happened was the task stayed the same and a purpose and a criteria statement were added. And I don't show you the rubric that went along with it. Um, so you can't actually look in detail at that criteria statement. But what else do you notice then about what's different about this assignment? Well, I wanted to look at what Tony said for me. So first, like, primary and secondary sources, um, synthesizing information that has not been well understood by students, and what really is well organized. So is this, does this pertain to the task part of the assignment? Are you noticing a difference in the task? Is that what you're saying? I'm having a little trouble hearing that. I, that wasn't really kind of what I wanted to address. I was just saying that I felt like it was so pretty Right, right. So even in this assignment, it could be more transparent and more helpful. And one thing that's important to recognize is that this is the visual artifact of a larger conversation. All of these examples are the visual artifact of a larger interaction. And so it's possible that maybe separate from this assignment, the teachers had provided, um, the teaching team had provided like a list of professionals who were already willing to be interviewed, for example, um, so that you would know where to go, or maybe their contact information was already provided to students. And we don't actually know what the rest of the, that whole interaction looks like. We really just can look at this artifact for what can be gained from, from this. Um, what do you notice is going on in the purpose of this assignment? Very focused. It's focused, and it also has several different due dates, right? And that was something that changed with a lot of our assignments. Teachers realized that they were asking students to do a lot, to practice a lot of skills in a single assignment, and so they broke them up into smaller scaffolded assignments where it was possible to be more specific about the goals that students would be metacognitively focused on for each single assignment. Um, and so that happened a lot with the scaffolding of assignments into smaller ones. Why don't we take a look at sample D, because I like the direction that that prior comment was going in, like finding ways to make this already pretty transparent assignment, an assignment that was good enough in our study to get the results you saw for UNLV students. I want to look at this and have you tell us how could you make this purpose statement more transparent. And so in sample D, and I'll give you a moment to look at it um, in just a while, 
Sample D is really written, it's an intro level science course, and it is really written for a science major. The audience for this assignment is a science major. And I want for you to look at that purpose statement and see if you could make it more transparent and relevant and accessible for someone who's never gonna make a science poster because they're taking this science course as a required course and they're not a science major. How would you revise this purpose statement to make it more transparent for the non-science major? At the uh, purpose to be a consumer of the research? Say that again, sorry? Have the purpose to be a consumer of the research rather yeah. than a designer of it. Nice. And, um, how to evaluate it. Great. Great. And so the goal of being able to consume and evaluate the reliability of scientific information that comes at you, that is a goal that is relevant and accessible and useful for the non-science major. Whereas putting it in the context of designing a poster or evaluating a poster excludes the non-science major. And so you've kind of pinpointed a really good and simple way to make that purpose statement more transparent and more equitably applicable to all students. Um, so now that you've done that, it feels to me like you are ready to begin doing this with your very own assignments. Um, and so I wanna ask, for uh, Dr. Bakewell to help us. Maybe we'll take a really quick five minute break. Um, and when you come back, I want you to sit next to a disciplinary stranger because the next activity depends upon you interacting in a pair with someone who does not really understand your discipline very well. You want to find the strangest possible disciplinary stranger that you can because they are going to play the role of novice student looking at your assignment or hearing about your assignment that you have in mind. So Meg, can you help us do that? And we'll come right back in about four or five minutes. So a couple of points I want to make before we break. One is that the name tags do have uh, affiliations on them, so that can help you to find a stranger if it's a, a stranger you haven't met yet. Um, and the other thing is to say that um, in conversation with Mary Ann before this, it's not necessary at all that you have a paper assignment with you for this. It's even, in fact, better if you're just thinking of an assignment and that you can be in conversation. Yeah, this is going to be based on a verbal description of the assignment. That's our ideal scenario. <laughs> All right, everyone. So let's come back from the break. Already these uh, great conversations with strangers are happening, so that's awesome. And I hear you starting to describe your assignment. Um, <laughs> but um, I think Marianne has a little bit of direction for us, so just bring I sure back together. I sure do. Thank you, Meg. Um, so, yeah. I would never want to pass up an opportunity to make use of the transparent framework, so I'm going to use it right now to give you a kind of rationale for why we're about to do um, this activity together. So our purpose, uh, the knowledge that you'll gain, um, is you'll gain some insights about how to promote student success by using a transparent framework in an assignment that you intend to give to your students skills, um, you'll be applying transparency and you'll also be engaging a community of practice, which is why you come to workshops like this in the first place. The task, um, I'm going to lead you through four steps. They're going to take between two and three minutes each. You'll be doing each step in pairs and for each step you'll have a separate slide that has a question on it or a couple of questions and those will be the questions you'll be focusing on during that timed segment. And Meg and I will be timing these together. Um, and I'll make the screen do this when your time's up so that you'll be able to see when it's time to um, focus on the next step with the next question and instruction. The criteria are these. We will have succeeded in, in this activity when you walk out of here with a draft of an assignment that you could use in a course coming up, um, a draft of a transparently designed assignment. And you'll also walk away with some helpful insights from your colleagues who are playing the role of novices to your discipline, which is why 
be paired up with a disciplinary string. And so um, I'm going to ask you to take two minutes each, and you're going to, we'll time it for you in a moment. You're going to describe an assignment that you have in mind to your partner in your pair. And this assignment should be an assignment that is not already so perfectly transparent that it has no room for improvement. Um, it might be an assignment that comes from the first half of the term with students. It might be an assignment that comes right after you've taught the students some basic tools or theory or terminology that you want them to use, right? So it might be right after you've taught them something that you want them to apply for the first time. Um, and it's okay if the assignment doesn't exactly have fit those criteria, but um, it, this is just a sort of helpful set of pointers for what kind of assignment you might use for this. And so I want for each person to just have in mind an assignment, one that you can use in the future. And we'll be focusing on this assignment for about the next half hour. Um, and I'm going to give you two minutes each way to describe this assignment to your partner. So before, and, and you can describe, um, two minutes really isn't enough to describe the entire assignment. So just describe the most important aspects of this assignment to your partner. And you'll have two minutes to do that each way. Um, what can I clarify further before I hit the timer for two minutes? What else should I explain better? Any questions? Looks like we're good. Okay. So one person is going to describe one assignment for two minutes, and then after that, we'll stop and we'll switch. So two minutes. Ready? Go. Okay. Time's up. Now I know that you haven't necessarily had enough time. To so let's all come back. So that wasn't necessarily enough time, two minutes on each assignment, to really get the full understanding of the assignment, but that's okay. That's intentional because it makes the next steps of this um, even more helpful for you. So the next step that we're going to move on to, and these three steps coming up are going to focus on, you can probably guess, the first one's going to focus on purpose. What do you think the next one's going to focus on? Ask. Yeah. And then the third one? Criteria. Excellent. Criteria. All right, so let's start with the purpose step. And so what you have here um, is a set of three questions at the bottom half of the screen. And in each case, we want for the listener to tell the author of the assignment they heard about the answer to these three questions. Five years after the student takes this course, what do you think is the essential knowledge the student should still retain because they learned it from doing this assignment? And what skills should the students still be able to perform because they practiced doing them on this assignment? And why is that knowledge and those skills important for the students now five years later? Now here's the tricky part of this. As the person playing the role of novice, answers these questions for the author of the assignment, the author of the assignment is not gonna say anything. You're not gonna take on the teacher role of coaching or correcting or guiding. You're gonna to be totally silent. And what you're gonna do as you listen to your novice try to answer these questions is you're gonna write down anything you hear that helps you to define the purpose statement even more clearly for your actual novice students. Because if this person has any trouble guessing, they're gonna be probably better prepared than your average novice student undergraduate to be guessing. Um, so any doubt that they have, any, anything they point out that's helpful that you want your students to recognize about the purpose of the assignment, write that down too. But what you're not doing is talking or responding or coaching. What you are doing is writing down your draft purpose statement for your assignment. So before I hit the timer, I think we'll do three minutes each way on this. Before I hit the timer, is there anything I need to clarify better, especially the part about where the assignment author doesn't talk? <laughs> yeah. 
I, I assume that we are allowed to ask clarifying questions if there were, because there, there might have been some assignments that weren't explained enough detailed for us to understand the purpose of the call. So if you're the author of the assignment, you can, I guess, I'm, I'm really wanting for you to not talk. But if you are the novice, then yes, you could be saying, I think the knowledge might be this, but I don't really know, and my question would be X. And then based on what that question would be, you don't answer it, but you write down something that helps you formulate the purpose statement for your actual students. Thank you. Because I want you to really spend the full three minutes listening and writing. Okay, other clarification before um, Meg and I hit that timer for three minutes? Okay, so this is for the first assignment, three minutes, go. Okay, time's up. So now we're gonna move on to the second step, which is gonna be about the task. We're gonna move on to task now. This part's a little bit easier. Um, what we wanna do here is we wanna have each partner list for the author of the assignment, what steps would you take to do the assignment? And that means from the very first thing you do up until the moment you submit that assignment. So maybe the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna Google something, or you're gonna go to a writing center, or you're gonna go to office hours, or you're gonna call your mom. Just the very first thing you're gonna do, and the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing after that, every step until you submit. Um, and then the author of the assignment, your job again, I'm so sorry, is to not respond verbally, but instead to jot down the task portion of your draft assignment. And in that task, you wanna write down the steps you're hearing that are really good steps that you want your students to replicate. And you also wanna jot down anything that you're hearing that you really don't want your students to do because that might lead them down a really unproductive path and waste a lot of their working time. Um, so you're gonna write down a draft of your task statement for this assignment while you listen to your novice. And we're gonna do that two minutes each way and before we hit the timer, I just want to make sure, is there anything else I need to clarify? Is anything more I need to explain better before we start timing for two minutes? Go again. Okay, Meg, here we go. Two minutes, go. Okay, that's two minutes on the task. So now we're moving on to the third step and we're gonna focus on the criteria for this assignment. And I think we could try doing just two minutes each way. This time, you'll be so glad to hear, this is the opportunity where the authors of the assignments, this is a give and take back and forth conversation. And what we want here is, I, I've listed three questions on the bottom of the slide. And we want the novice to look at these three questions. And right now, I can tell you, the answer to all of these three questions will be no, because you only had two minutes to hear a description of this assignment. So you're probably not confident that you're doing the task effectively. You're probably not confident that you're doing excellent work. And it is unlikely that you have good annotated examples, or that you had a conversation of real world examples and the criteria for your assignment. So given that the answer to these right now is no, we really want for you to answer to the author of your assignment this question. It's in the green highlighted box at the bottom of the slide. To answer yes to these questions, what would you need? Would you want a checklist of criteria? Would you want a full rubric with four columns and five rows? Would you want samples of work from the community? Do you want written examples or photographic examples? Just what, what do you need in order to answer yes to these three questions? And we'll do this two minutes each way as a give and take conversation. Um, Meg, what questions are there before we hit the timer? Anyone? Looks like we're ready. Okay, two minutes on one assignment, go.
Okay, that is two minutes. Meg, are we ready? Yeah, let's all come back together for next step. So that's been our, our two minutes. Okay. So now you've got some kind of a draft of a transparently designed assignment that you could use with students as soon as tomorrow or next term. Um, and remember that for faculty in our study, we did this two times. It just took two assignments to get the impact that you saw reflected in the charts that I showed you in the research review. So think of how much more helpful, how much more benefit could accrue to students if you did this more than twice. And in fact, some of the teachers in our study now, years later, um, are, have done this to more assignments. They've done it to in-class activities. They've done it to a whole course syllabus. Some faculty are using this as a framework for meeting with students in advising sessions. Um, others are using it as a framework for how to run an assessment of, of learning outcomes in a whole department or school. Um, but in this case, you've got one transparent assignment that you could start using. And it would be relatively simple for you to do this to a second assignment, whether that happens in the context of another workshop um, that would happen through the CRLT, or whether you might just use the annotate, the, the checklist, the individual checklist on the back page of your handout, uh, the self-guided know how to design a transparent assignment a set of questions but remember that the most useful tool would be that framework handout that's designed the student version of it um, on the I think it's on the inside of the last page of your handout because no matter how well you have designed a transparent assignment you have just done that with the most ridiculously overly educated novice student you will ever talk to about this assignment <laughs> And your students will be much better experts than you or your colleagues about how to make an assignment transparent for them in the next class where you're using that assignment. So you do, I encourage you to share that uh, framework with your students and with other colleagues. Everything that we've got here, all these materials are designed to be copied and shared freely. Um, I, let's wrap up by saying, we'll just go back to our purpose task criteria framework. Uh, we set out to understand how transparent assignments can contribute to more equitable student success. We reviewed a research, the research findings. You then applied that to sample assignments and you're walking away with an understanding of that research, some strategies in your encyclopedic handout for applying transparency in assignments, and some draft ideas for your own teaching practice in an assignment. I would invite any of you, if you wish, to run the survey on your own. You could do that. There's a short Google link at the bottom here um, where you could sign up to run the survey if you wish on your own so that you could get charts in a confidential instructor report where uh, that's anonymous aggregate data about the students' responses about their learning experiences in your courses. And you might even want to think about doing a kind of bench uh, a, a baseline measure now by surveying students now in a course that you might teach again later so that you could run it a second time to see what difference it made when you incorporated a couple of um, transparent assignments. Some folks are even using the transparent framework um, for an in-class activity, just making it a shorter framework with a much shorter, simpler purpose, task, and criteria statement for an in-class activity as a way of helping students practice the skills they will need for the take-home part of the assignment. So they'll kind of scaffold it with an in-class practice and then the transparent assignment as a take-home. So I'm happy to pause for any kinds of questions or comments or concerns that you may have after you've worked through these assignments a bit. This is survey in the end of the term or in the middle of the term? So the survey, if you were to sign up right now, you would run it at the end of the term as the in the last week of the classes meet. If you sign up in advance to do this next term, we have a short 12 question pre-survey that asks students a little bit about their competence level in different skill areas um, that you could use as a pre-post measure inside of the same semester. But you'd get more information for yourself 
if you did a kind of before and after, where in a version of the course where it's, you haven't done this yet, and then in the version of the course where you have done it. Um, you have one of the um, uh, less transparent examples is the math 181 example. Do yeah. You, do you have the transparent version of that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish I did. On that one, we just had the pre. And that's not an example that was part of our own research. That's just an example that I found on the internet and pulled it off because it was a good example of just a list of tasks. Um, and sometimes when we discuss that with STEM teachers, we decide that this is really about how a student can calculate and frame and understand increases and decreases. And sometimes people try to ground that in terms of an increase or decrease to something students care about, like the cost of an iPhone or um, their future salary or something like that. Um, but that's the closest we've gotten. I can tell you one of the concerns of the faculty in our original study was that when you spell out the task, um, some faculty didn't want to spell out the task for their student because they wanted their students to figure it out on their own. And in a couple of cases, this really made a lot of sense. One of the courses was a performing arts course, and another one was an engineering course where teachers wanted students to invent their own process for solving a particular problem. And so the compromise we reached there was we wanted to allow for that struggle for the student to invent the task, but we also wanted to preserve the student's confidence in their sense of belonging. So these folks wrote in their purpose statement something that sounded like this. The purpose of this assignment is for you to struggle and feel confused while you invent your own process for addressing the problem. And we think that was helpful in preserving the confidence and belonging because students knew they were supposed to be feeling confused and that clarity would come later. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right, well, let's thank Marianne. And uh, before you go, I just wanted to make a couple of announcements. So uh, one is that Marianne was talking about doing this potentially with two assignments. And I just wanted to say that um, at, I would be very happy to consult with you on a second assignment. I'm a biologist, so I won't necessarily be a disciplinary stranger with everybody. But, um, but that is something that I or, or we have a diversity of disciplines here at CRLT would be very happy to go through with you. Um, you can email me here. Um, as far as the uh, foundational course initiative goes, I just wanted to also extend the invitation for any of you who are interested in learning more or would like to be in conversation with the initiative and we haven't started that conversation yet, um, you can learn more on our website and definitely be in touch with me. I'd be very happy to talk with you about courses that you think might be candidates for the initiative. So um, that's all I've got. And, and just a thank you uh, to everybody for being here today. It's been fun uh, listening in on your conversations and hearing these assignments evolve. Thank you. Thank you.